Good morning. November and Metropolitan Community Colleges fall quarter are rushing by. Not only do we feel the rush, but we've also had very fascinating weather. It was 75, I think, degrees yesterday here in Omaha on November 9th. Today, the temps are going to go down, and we know that we're headed to some cold temperatures tomorrow. So hold on, audience, and thank you. Thank you for being with us every for every Native American Heritage Month program or several of them, or even if today is your first one, we welcome you. Today will be the last program in November and the last program in Native American Heritage Month, we need to leave time for the important end of the academic term work for you, the students, faculty, and staff, and community members. We um, thank you for understanding our need to honor this important educational period. Your microphones and chat with other audience members are turned off. Send your messages or questions for today's speaker through the chat function to moderator Barbara Velasquez. And uh, let me say that uh, the presentation today will involve a significant amount of time for question and answer. So feel very comfortable to get your questions out early to moderator Barbara Velasquez, and I will have them ready. I'd also like to encourage you to watch the chat for other important messages that come through, including a link to the online evaluation. So one more time, I'd like you to listen to the initial text of the White House's 2022 proclamation on Native American Heritage Month. During National Native American Heritage Month, we celebrate indigenous peoples past and present and rededicate ourselves to honoring tribal sovereignty, promoting tribal self-determination, and upholding the United States solemn trust and treaty responsibilities to tribal nations. America has not always delivered on its promise of equal dignity and respect for Native Americans. For centuries, broken treaties, dispossession of ancestral lands, and policies of assimilation and termination sought to decimate Native populations and their ways of life. Despite this painful history, indigenous peoples, their governments, and their communities have persevered and flourished. As teachers and scholars, scientists and doctors, writers and artists, business leaders and elected officials, heroes in uniform, and so much more, Native Americans have made and continue to make immeasurable contributions to our country's progress. Today's presenter, Mr. Aldo Sione, is a community advocate who has fought against the placement of oil pipelines across native land, educating communities about the value of precious natural resources. He is also a co-founder, Wicha Ali, that heals communities by healing men, assisting participants to reclaim healthy masculinity. I think you're gonna really enjoy um, learning from Mr. Aldo Sioni as he shares using culture and story to model healthy relationships. Welcome, Aldo. Uh, relatives, good morning. I greet you with a warm heart and a hearty handshake. And um, I introduce myself in Lakota because we're going to be talking about the work that we did in Lakota country and Ochitishakoin territory. And uh, going to share some of these teachings that come with it. Um, and when they were passed down to me, they were passed down to me in Lakota to be able to be shared to help relatives have a, a good good relationship to one another. So I appreciate all of you being on the phone today, all of you participating in this uh, Native American History Month, Awareness Month, and, and uh, taking the time to visit about these things. Um, today, I want to share a little bit about our program, Ucha Agli. Uh, my brother, Greg, Greg Cloud, and I started this back in uh, 2013 is when we officially created the organization. Um, the organization was founded after a men's coalition meeting that was sponsored by uh, the Great Plains Northern Women's Association. They, they sponsored a meeting to discuss what's men's involvement in ending domestic and sexual violence in our homes and communities. And they invited men to come together in the Black Hills to have these conversations. And we have all these wonderful cultural teachings about how to be good relatives to one another. And from those conversations and these teachings, we started to create a framework. 
and uh, my my little brother Greg was so inspired um, by what he was hearing from these elder men and, and our aunties and grandmas that he came back and he said, brother, he said, we got to do something. We got to do something with all of this. And at the time we were, he was working in the ele elementary school and middle school in uh, Mission, South Dakota on the Rosebud Reservation. And I, at the time I was working for the domestic violence shelter, um, White Buffalo Calf Women Society. And we started to formalize what are these teachings and, and, and how do we use best practices to help the men in our communities heal from their trauma so they're not perpetuating violence in their homes. And uh, through that process of visiting with our relatives and engaging our community, we formed our organization, We Cha Agli, which is short for We Chasha, which means man, and Aglipi, which means to go home. So it's, it's returning our men home. We kind of feel that as men, we became lost. One, because we forgot who we were and who we were supposed to be as far as being good relatives to our brothers and sisters, our, our mothers, our aunties, our daughters. And uh, also because our, our, a lot of our cultural life ways were taken from us. So um, as, that, as that understanding's materialized, we started to, to work with them in the community, particularly around the legal system as a diversion program. We work with men who have a first time offense charged with domestic violence. I'm sorry. And so we work with these men um, doing cognitive behavioral therapy and using Ellen Pence's model of, uh, of change. And we applied that to our teachings. And then later on, we created the camp, um, which we're going to talk about today and how that all materialized. So I want to show a short video. It's about uh, 15 minutes long. Um, I encourage all of you to, as you're watching the video, to, to, to make to ask questions to um, our moderator, Barbara, here um, so that we can break apart what you're seeing. But this is one of many tools that we use to engage our community in. Um, so I really hope you enjoy the video and uh, that we have some good solid questions afterward um, so that we can continue this conversation, not only about Native American Heritage Month, but really about how do we become better relatives for one another and how we support each other as a community. So if uh, you guys would be willing to put that on, shoot. We say we're a horse nation because the horse brings so much to us every single direction. And those directions are represented by their legs. Their legs go out to each direction. Their head points up to the direction of the clouds. The tail, makatakia, that's their strength, that's their resilience. Hip, hip, hip. Hip, hip. Ah, hip, ah, hip. Yep, yep. Yep. All right, come on in here, boys. Close this up. The horses probably already know who they're going to choose. I'm going to stand out there with you guys. I think one at a time will do this, and the horse will choose you. Each horse has been through something completely different. Whatever trauma that horse has been through, they often choose somebody who's been through very similar trauma. In one way or another, all the men that were involved in our circle. We were all touched by violence. We grew up with our fathers being violent or our uncles being violent, and that all resided inside of us. We all needed to change that. We knew that our trauma was because our violence growing up. Um, the volunteer base, whoever wants to go right now. Who wants to be the first? There we go. Go ahead, head on in there. Everybody else just watch. I want you to understand what they're going through and see which ones are being passed out, see how they treat each other. For the majority of the men, they're being charged with domestic uh, violence. And part of the court's recommendation is that they go into a program on the reservation. Hold on. Hold on. Yep. Yep, yep. Yep, yep, yep. Come on now. Come on now. Yep. Yep, yep. Come on now. I don't see it as rehabilitation. I don't see it as re-education. I see it as a, a reawakening.
if I have a woman that's sitting in front of me and she's being black and blue and she tells me, oh, he's a good father, you know what I say? How can he be if he, this is how he treats the mother of his children? I see it every day in my shelter. Believe me. We can hold 36 women and children, and guess what? We're full most of the time. What does that tell you? So you've all been arrested, correct? Right? You've all been arrested. So how many of you guys have children? All of you. Do you ever think about the things that you do in your lives and how it affects your babies? When you're in the home and the police are called and there's mommy crying, house is torn apart, I mean, what do you think that does to your children? Did you yourself experience that as a young child? You did? You did too, right? But when we grow up in trauma situations like that, you're always waiting for the hammer to drop. As adults, we create that. I want you to think about, am I just creating chaos? You're so used to your level of adrenaline, anxiety, and crisis being high that when it's gone, it doesn't feel normal. It's huge that you're here. You know, these guys are really good to work with, and I hope you get something from your weekend here. You may not be able to undo some of the damage, but you should work toward trying to be part of the solution. Okay? Yep, yep. And I wish you guys all the luck in the future, all right? I hope things change for you. Okay? Yeah. We're gonna do some activities with them later on today. That's gonna to require a deeper connection that we need to have with each horse. So by us brushing them, you're also cleansing them from those type of traumas that they have inside of themselves, but also from the fact that they helped other people. We really teach not just culture, we're culturally based, um, but we dig into our culture and how our culture teaches us as men to be men. We look at our historical trauma that we suffer as nations. You know, we didn't have this type of violence. You know, the Western society exerted violence onto our nations and they pulled families apart and split them up and they beat children and raped children and women and they killed the men. And each generation that comes on, it gets more and more violent because we're dealing with that historical trauma and we really internalize it. And when you get told that for many, many, many years, you start believing it. The seventh element, the seventh and sacred element is us. Makasatomia, we are the full around connection. When we groom the horse, when we communicate with the horse, we make that full circle. We represent all them seven energies, all those seven directions. We're way out here, but you know, we have to rely on them, you know, commodities, you know food stamps, you know, once a month check, you know. But you don't see no, like, really opportunities, like, around here. Out there, some people don't, like, like us Lakotas or just natives. Like, they'll, they'll just call us prairie niggers, and uh, we go into a store and just white person, well, we don't serve native people. The work of the oppressor is to keep you so confused that you're in a state of fear. There's no resources for men on the reservation. We're still constantly being traumatized, and there's a lot of internalized oppression and lateral violence that occurs because we don't like ourselves. You give them the energy, they're gonna take it. You give them your anger, they're gonna take it. Communicate with them that you're sad, they're gonna take that sadness away from you, and then you're gonna become happy. here. So I was violent in, in a lot of different ways. I used a lot of name calling and putting down. I used a lot of emotional abuse. Okay, who'd like to go first? Here, all right. 
Look right there. Yeah, I just kept oh. building up until finally I just blew up. And it is not in our tradition to disrespect women or hit them. So deep inside me is just, it, it tore me up. And if your partner don't want to do it, do they have to? And if your partner don't want to do it, do they have to? Now, oftentimes, we have to remember if something's too difficult between a situation and you can't force it to happen, then what do you think you should probably do? You work around the problem. I've always been a people's person. I always got along with everybody. With my partners, it's kind of different. So he's trying to control you right now. See when he's doing that? Mm -hmm. He's trying to control you. He's like, no, I'm in control. You're going to do what I want. I don't want to go anywhere. And sometimes in our lives, did you ever kind of use that? Power and control? That kind of fits, because, you know, someone play games, I'll play games too. Sometimes that's not the healthiest thing to do either. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? No. I mean, you can see it here, right here. He's showing me by his actions that there's some things inside you that you still need to deal with. You know what I mean? Yeah. Me and... My better half got in the argument and it just went south and by the time you know it, I had no control. I was, I came to in the junk tank and that's an ugly feeling, but I, I was scared. I was scared of what I did and how I did it or why I did it. First thing that went to my head was help, help, you know, like someone, I need someone to talk to. I need someone to talk to me, help me out and everything. Come on, this way, come on. Come on, Cola. There you go. Good job, Mr. Mm -hmm. Neck. Very good job. Come on. There you go, buddy. I was uh, not only physically beaten, but sexually assaulted. I think one of the most horrific times was uh, when I was nine years old. I stayed nine years old for a long time. When a man is stuck at an age where he shouldn't be, he does things that he shouldn't do because he doesn't realize the consequence that comes from that. I can't teach a man how to be a man. I can teach them the struggles that I've been through and if they can relate to it, and then when they do relate to it, then they can begin their process of healing and their growth. When the horse was pulling, it kind of made me feel like when Kristen was, I had her by her arms and she didn't like it. One night, it just went too far. I kicked the phone out of her hand. And as I was doing that, I fractured her wrist. And they go run upstairs, call the cops. But every, every time you don't grab her, every time you don't hit her, every time you say a kind word to her, it's like building that back up again, that trust. This class has helped me out a lot, especially what I experienced today, today with the horse. Yeah, I felt him, he felt me. It was, oh no, it was, a, it was a good vibe. And this horse has been through the worst, right? But that doesn't mean that horse is broken or any less worthy of love. Yeah. grow up and uh, I think this class is a turning point for them and we uh, offer that space for them to grow up well being a man is taking responsibility for your actions and I gotta straighten up I gotta straighten up to have a good name for myself when we're violent towards a woman we're our rights of a man are being stripped away we work our entire lives to bring that honor back. We've been here for a couple of days, a couple of long, hard days. What we want to create is a safe place, the sage going around, a safe place for us to share. Bring your minds here. Bring your hearts here. Today, Mr. Neck is going to be completed from the class, and he completed and fulfilled his commitment.
So part of the class, just like you guys that are, are coming up on a graduation soon, we talk about things in our lives. We talk about the incident that brought us into this class. We talk about our use of violence. So that's the very first question I'm gonna be asking. So Mr. Neck, if you would share your use of violence before this class. I'm Aaron Neck and um, yeah, I did have some problems uh, when I was younger, especially when I was growing up with my ex-wife. What are some of the types of violence you may have used? Being mean, saying mean stuff, backhanding. But afterwards I would, you know, I would think about my kids. And think what I put them through, you know, what they saw. Uh, I don't want to be a bad man. Do you know that you're accountable for that action? Uh, yes, I do. Mm, yeah. Do you forgive yourself? Well, sort of, but not kind of, you know. And I ask that question because a lot of times, if we don't give ourselves the permission to say, that it was in the past and I need to move forward now, and really own that in our hearts, that past is just going to keep driving us and showing up again. And I believe you when you say, I'm going to use these understandings to be a good man, to be a good partner, to be a good father. The last part of that is we're going to make these tobacco flags. If you want to take this and wipe it down with that sage, you put something that's bothering you inside of this tie. And your full energy, your, your entire heart, you put that in there. You roll it up, you tie it. Never visiting that old person who you used to be again. And I take it from you. When I tie it onto the staff, we as a society of Wichogli would carry them burdens of violent men. The second one is we're gonna make a flag for you. It's the same thing, you're gonna put positive things in there, put the good things. That one you're gonna tie up as well. And that one you can take with you. All right, before we eat, last meal of the day for here at the camp, I'll offer a song for our food. <laughs> Our hope is that we do change one man at a time, but at the same time when that one man is being changed, that the other men see that there is hope, that we too can change. So this program that <clears throat> that we offer is it's a one year probationary program. And I just wanted to clarify that because sometimes people go, this is what you do on a weekend, you know, but all of these men are court mandated to do a six month intensive program where we use uh, the men who choose to batter curriculum. It was, like I said, developed through the Praxis Institute with Dr. Ellen Pence. Um, we do this cognitive behavioral re-education model where we talk about um, power and control dynamics and uh, the use of violence in all its ways from physical to emotional, psychological, spiritual, uh, economic, um, all the various tactics that are used. And we work for two hours every week with those men and engage them in uh, re-educating them. And as the men come to completing their program, then we have an intensive uh, three-day kind of uh, encampment. The guys come in on the first day and they stay with us and we work with them. And in this camp was uh, really focused around the use of equine facilitated mental health techniques. Um, and we partnered up with Sinti Galeshka University to utilize the, their equine program. Um, Greg and I both worked closely with the college in implementing some of those techniques and integrating a lot of our cultural understandings within the horse program. Um, so through that interaction, we're able to not only model behavior with the horses, but use the horses for indirect communication. So that instead of attacking someone 
or making them feel defensive as we start to explore their use of violence. We talk through the horse. And in that way, there's a level of comfort and uh, openness that develops because of it. The lady who you um, saw there uh, in the program was not only our shelter director at the time, but later on uh, is now a tribal judge and was a federal or uh, tribal prosecutor. And our auntie there, she could come in and talk to the men, both as a prosecutor, but also as a grandmother and as a auntie and as a sister. So we, we really try and partner with the domestic violence shelter and the women in our community to hold us accountable as we're visiting with men so that there's a level of transparency there in our, in our interactions and in our relationships. So uh, Barbara, are there any questions that popped up uh, during the video presentation? Yes, we do have questions. Um, how many repeat offenders, how many stay violence free? Do you have right so our recidivism rate is right now we're sitting at around one and a half percent so through people living on the reservation that have attended our program and completed now mind you our completion rate that that could also i want to clarify that too we have had over 500 men in the program and they're not all from rosebud they are all native men but they might've been from either Rosebud or Pine Ridge or other men that are living on the reservation or you know, their partners do. So they interacted with the program. So out of, that, out of those 500 men, we've had 140 completions. Out of those 140 completions, we, we had one person um, that I'm aware of um, get charged again with domestic violence, but not on our reservation. They, were, they had gone back to their reservation. Um, Part of our program is, uh, like Greg was saying at the end there, is um, we're a society or we operate as if we're a society in that sense. Um, so when we see each other in the community, part of the programming in the class is that we have to shake each other's hands in public. So it's a constant reminder that you're, you've gone through this um, difficult period in your life, but that there's support around you so that we can act as a kind of a de-escalation unit when we see each other in the community. So a lot of times we'll get the, their relatives will come to us or um, their children and um, they'll be like, you know, thank you so much for, you know, the change that occurred or, you know, a man will see us, one of the men in the program will see us and come over and say, can I really talk to you right now? Can I come by and have coffee? Sure, let's visit, you know. And it works uh, to de-escalate that. I'm not saying that, um, violence isn't there and within the home, but our main focus is to create an expectation of safety for their partners and their families. So first and foremost, when a man is uh, sent to our program, that affords that family two hours every week of unsupervised time where they can make a choice whether this is working for us or not. Um, beyond that piece, our goal is to make someone less violent. So the de-escalation from physical violence to emotional, right? And not saying that any type of violence is permissible, but the fact that we can cycle someone down because once we're in that program and we get to really model behavior and have conversations, you know, we make it very clear that it's a choice to use violence. You're making a choice to do it, regardless of your trauma, like Greg was saying, you know, when he was nine years old, he was nine years old for a long time. And when you start seeing men who are in a abusive pattern of behavior, they're operating like a child. And a lot of it is because they're being triggered and they're revisiting that trauma. So they're operating from that victim stance, but then they become the aggressor. So you got this grown man that's acting like an upset nine-year-old. And that's a very dangerous thing to have in your home. So that's just to kind of clarify those pieces there, you know. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, is this program available only to men who live on a reservation? So it's available on the reservation, particularly on Rosebud, because we have the infrastructure. Um, over the last, I don't know, I guess now 12 years or something, even before our program was started, you know, we've worked very closely with uh, both tribal and non tribal communities to look at different approaches for de-escalation of violence and 
uh, addressing domestic violence. Um, because we feel that um, it's, it's, it's really the responsibility of the men in the community to create the expectation of how we behave amongst each other, that this behavior isn't allowed. Um, unfortunately, a lot of communities don't put the, um, don't put the, I guess, onus um, on, the, on the perpetrators as much as they should to make change. So like for instance, Rapid City, there's federal mandates for how um, men who are prosecuted with domestic violence should interact and what kind of uh, program should be offered. But the county, for instance, doesn't really force them to actually participate in those programs. Um, so they'll give them an online course or something to that effect. And we find that a lot of those online courses and whatnot don't uh, offer the same level of accountability. Um, and in some cases, just re-victimize the, uh, the family because it becomes a family member that's actually doing the programming. Um, so I think as a nation, uh, not only as tribal nations, but as a, as a nation altogether and as a society, we need to really focus more attention on that mental health piece and on what we're actually doing to engage in those conversations on a one-on-one -on -one level, systematically and community-wide. So audience members, um, I'm impressed that you you paid attention to important details that were on that video. Um, we have a question. After completing the program, is anything done for one of the big problems that was mentioned, the lack of opportunity for men on the reservation? So part of it is we model some of the community interaction, right? So. A lot of a lot of our probation uh, period and, and our, our classwork is actually going back and painting the ball fields or creating benches or that kind of engagement. So opportunities to engage the community are presented and modeled as far as work and economic development. You know, there's always change and there's always new ideas and there's always people that are trying to bring back that change in the community. Um, you know, we, we're dealing with a history of oppression. And it's not only historical, but it's happening every day with our interactions with the government. I was part of that um, historical trauma piece, um, congressional hearings that happened in um, Bismarck, North Dakota back in 2016. And I don't know if any of you had the ability to participate in that or have seen any of the transcripts for that. But if you remember back in 2016, that's when all the, the no Dakota access movement was happening in Standing Rock and we're Later on, it was come to find out that trans, um, I'm sorry, Dakota Access had worked closely with the Army Corps and engineers to subvert tribal rights. And the tribes actually sued and won in court against the federal government, against the Army Corps of Engineers, because they showed collusion between the Army and the US government and oil companies. Um, the pipeline was originally slated to go through Bismarck, North Dakota, and they moved it to the reservation because they considered that a low consequence zone. Um, and that was in violation of NAGPRA uh, and the EPA. Um, those water rights are still in jeopardy. The pipeline was forcibly put in. And when our tribal, our tribal presidents were all sitting there talking to UN repertoires and congressional members, um, they were talking about these, you know, <laughs> these congressional relatives there. Um, they had appointed some some doctors and what have you to talk about historical trauma. And, I, at the time, I remember it was uh, Dave Archambault. He said, how can we talk about tr historical trauma when you're currently perpetuating trauma on our people? We can't even get to the point to reflect and heal on what's happened to us when you are literally sending um, the, at the time it was the reserve, right? The, the army reserve, you're sending them from the same place that Custard Road from. <laughs> You're, you're re-victimizing us. Our kids are watching our people being shot at because you want to put a pipeline down. And you're not talking about how extractive industry mirrors domestic and sexual violence. You know, And even the, 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 the language that's used right um, at the time, talking about you know, they're going to go ahead and they're going to utilize this virgin soil and they're going to put this pipeline in. And then no one thinks about the correlation between water rights and um, birthing rights and how that affects women's bodies 
because there are as they have there's you know documented cases of how that's directly impacting how fetuses are born the contamination of water so when we talk about opportunity we we realize that a good percentage of indian country or reservation land is some of the the most pristine and untouched parts of this country and there's a huge resources so it's also one of the areas that government constantly is trying to get into to be able to extract resources from bears ears to uh, you know to to the old uh, bombing runs and uranium mines uh, outside of pine ridge to the coal mines in montana you know these these lands uh, are not only sacred and support our natural lifeways um, but we don't see resource development and extraction in the same way as Western expansion does. So there, there are there are movements to create more economic uh, opportunity, but at the same time, we're also challenging the narrative of what does that really look like and how can we create opportunity without jeopardizing our relationship to the to the world around us and to our natural life ways. Thank you. Um, audience, continue to send those questions. As you can see, this can become a very robust discussion. Um, so in the documentary, it speaks of what happens to the men being a reawakening. Uh -huh. And what signs do you see in that environment to know that reawakening is happening? Well, Considering that we couldn't really openly practice our culture until 1978, Freedom of Religion Act, um, we within our families, I mean, you always have that one uncle or auntie that's like the family historian that's talking about the 68 treaty or 51 treaty. And they're, they're talking about um, grandma so-and-so, grandpa so-and-so when they were there. Um, and if it's either that they're passing on oral tradition or they're passing on actual historical events or case law or things that they witness, you know, we we have those resources. So the reawakening portion is reminding ourselves of our relationships to our families and not to be operating in such a state of trauma that we forget and feel isolated. So we've all been educated to a certain degree. Every man that I've ever met walking down the road has always been told it's not right to hit women. But then why do men do it? Why don't why are men muting that voice within themselves that was instilled by someone from their past? And it's about reawaking those systems within ourselves and silencing the the violent ones and the traumatic ones, the traumatized ones and the hurt ones and remembering what are those safe places within ourselves? What are those safe places within our own mind, our own heart, our own body, so that those messages of how to be good relatives are louder and more present and that we can engage our, each other and our families in a much more real and holistic way. So that's why we like to use that word of, of reawaken because everyone knows what it feels like when you hurt your knee and your mom or your auntie comes over and touches you and says it's going to be okay and suddenly those tears go away and you feel held but something happens as we get older something happens when we get hurt and we forget what that touch is like that healthy safe touch that that showing of unconditional love and that's what we try to rekindle when we engage these these men in our communities and when we engage each other in these conversations of ending violence Wow, that's really, really powerful. Um, and it <laughs> it speaks to me because I'm, I'm living with a three-year-old grandson who's reminding me as an old woman that that kiss makes everything better, right? So I have to keep it in mind for the elders too. Um, so um, you've shared that, the well, at least the film demonstrated that the men involved are court-ordered um and we have a question that's come in about verbal abuse versus physical abuse uh women that this uh, audience member has worked with have told her that verbal abuse is worse and i know that you've you we heard about that a little bit on the video but is it likely that somebody would be asked to go through this training if they were not physically abusive if they were only verbally abusive 
there's there's a complicated piece right like we've had men that voluntarily wanted to be a part of the program and we engage those men um and we work with them because some of them say like i just i want to be a better man i know something's wrong um abuse and power and control dynamics are are destructive i think when it comes into the the physic the physical abuse versus the psychological abuse um, and I'll use the term psychological abuse versus verbal for a moment. I'll transpose those. Uh, they're not seen as easily. So therefore, and well, let's say they're not seen as easily. And also they're not as life threatening. They might be emotionally threatening and psychologically threatening, um, but they, um, they aren't life threatening or, or, or putting your children at risk physically so it, it's it seemed as a as a, a a less violent act though it definitely will feel more violent at times and can lead into other types of psychological manipulation um so a lot of the guys that get court ordered you would never see that and one of the reasons why we're so transparent with violence in our communities is because of poverty you know a lot of people disregard violence in a lot of suburban areas and big cities just because of the economic means to hide it, right? You know, you, you, in, in a, an impoverished community, you know, families are living together, you know, multiple families in a single home. So there's a level of transparency that comes from poverty that you don't get when you're in an affluent area. So a lot of the um, corrective, you know, corrective behavioral models that are out there are really focused on de-escalation of physical violence and harm and keeping people out of hospitals and stopping them from dying. Um, but I can totally agree with um, whomever asked the question around um, the verbally abusive pieces because that leads directly into, I mean, you've got everything from gaslighting um, to severe isolation to um, abuse when you're threatening people's lives and intimidation, you know, and really breaking each one of those things down and clarifying what that is because a lot of people are dismissive of what that looks like like economic abuse, spiritual abuse, right? Uh, we are hearing more and more about spiritual abuse kind of in the modern uh, kind of conversations um, in the media, like um, uh, using religion as a form of, of saying, I want, I want to be sexually intimate and someone's you know, rights being taken away because, well, that's what the partner's supposed to do. Um, instead of going, well, no, someone can say no and you need to respect that. And you don't have to have an expectation because you're in a relationship or because in the Bible, it says that you're supposed to, you know, that, so we have to redefine all of those things constantly and, and work to supporting um, the survivors. I don't really like using the word victim myself. I like to use the word survivors only because I, I feel that for someone to be strong enough to, to be present and to find healing that they're they're more than they're more than that they're they really are survivors and they're courageous people out there in the world that are that are thriving um regardless of what experiences they went through they're making the the sacrifices to change you know um i hope that answers the question or if someone wants more clarity on that i'm happy to expand upon it thank you is there a program like this for women that are abusers so the psychological component behind men and women is completely different. Um, there are some programs that are offered uh, specifically to the Practice Institute. Um, there is a model that's used with women. Um, the reason is really kind of simple is uh, um, men have a, a tendency to use power and control dynamics where women typically have retaliatory violence. So when they looked at homicide rates of, uh, of perpetrators of violence or uh, of women that had um, perpetuated domestic violence on their partners and actually committed either homicide or um, some type of assault. What they ended up finding was there was a history of violence and many times that there was you know, a lot of police reports where she had called in and said, I need help. And the police didn't respond properly. And it just became one of those situations where she didn't feel safe and she lashed out in protecting herself. Um, so that's a, a conversation that needs to be really clear on that 
it's 86 percent of those the women that were incarcerated were incarcerated because they had histories of abuse and they were retaliating for their safety um of the ones that were interviewed i think that was back in like 98 or 99 when they did that research um so there are there are cases and you know what's funny is that sometimes they do like this uh all-inclusive approach of things so sometimes probation would send women to our program and we're like uh yeah they can't be a part of our program they go well why and it's I think one is because it's inherently unsafe to put uh, a woman in, in a room with a bunch of men who are who are, who are violent that just the triggering uh in the stories is is a lot the revictimization that happens there but two it's just to discussing that it's not fair to put someone through a program that doesn't really address the needs that they that they have and discussing these things more clearly. We really appreciate your expertise in answering these questions. This is just, it's really powerful. Um, so in the video, we see you and Greg running um, the operation. Are there, in, in that particular setting, are there people learning from you? so that others can take on the responsibility? Do you, do you get requests to go and teach the, you know, teach others how to set up programs like this? Yeah, we've gone to several. I've, I've been to Potawatomi. Um, I've been to Oneida. Um, I know Greg's been up in the, the Pacific Northwest. Um, we've done trainings all across the country where because uh, we're sharing what we've learned and how we use our cultural stories to have these conversations. Um, but we don't teach what we do because it's it's irresponsible to do that to some degree because then we're bringing a, a completely foreign culture into that community. So a big part of what I've done myself when like I worked with La Jolla, for instance, here in California, um, is that I had to research what are your stories around domestic violence? What are your stories around um, gender roles? What are your stories around multiple genders? What are your stories about um, corrective behaviors? And as we began to explore those stories, particularly the songs, um, they have a lot of key um, information within them because the songs seem to have been able to be uh, insulated a bit from cultural change when we begin to explore nuance. And we end up creating this, uh, reference list of behavior that then we incorporate into how we're working with people like for instance here in california they're big on using rattles and they're singing uh, and bird songs are really crucial to the community here and um, if you watch if you watch one of the bird singers they always have their rattles wrapped <coughs> excuse me and they're very um they're very sacred and prized possessions <coughs> so we created a work, a rattle making workshop and uh, <clears throat> said, um, you know, the first part of getting our rattle is we have to go find the gourd. So we have to ask our grandmother, the earth for consent to take one of her children. So we start talking about what is it to, to offer tobacco to this gourd and offering it consent. So then we start to carve out the gourd and process it and dry it out and keep the seeds. Well, what are the seeds in relationship to the gourd? Well, that's the future. Those are our children. Oh, okay. So we talk about dynamics of creating an environment. The gourd itself is a healthy environment. <coughs> the handle of the gourd is made of wood. And as we're <coughs> processing the handle, well, the wood and handle goes within the gourd. So what does that what does that look like? What does that model that man models? A cisgendered relationship, right? The heterosexual dynamic. So it's modeling the interaction between that <clears throat> that female and that male, and the life that's within her. So then we talk about as you're shaking that gourd, those children are dancing because you're giving them their past and you're giving them a future and you're giving them energy. So look what you have in front of you. You have this instrument that is a model for how you live your life, and look at how gingerly you take care of it. Why haven't you done that at home in your day to day life? And it's, you see men start to cry. But if I had said that up in South Dakota, then there wouldn't have been the correlation because those aren't the tools that we use, you know. <clears throat> so every people have a beautiful story. Every people have a, 
of a unique understanding and relationship to the way they see the world. So it's important that as we share how we've adapted um, our cultural life ways and information that we've acquired, how do we model that in other communities and, and create a framework for them to be able to address their people in a very culturally responsible way? Because this is that reawakening. It's that reclaiming of cultural knowledge. It's, it's coming back and saying, though our culture was, was banned until 1978, we have a right to practice it and to thrive. Just like that opening statement from the White House. We have a responsibility, a duty to, to live in the best way we can and to bring those teachings present so that our grandchildren and great-grandchildren have them to, for use. And that they don't have that void within themselves, but then instead they have this empowering energy that helps them uh, move forward in a way that's healthy and happy. Thank you. So we, um, one of our last questions, and then I'd like to ask you to, um, I know you're a, a skilled storyteller. If you could share with us um, an example of a story that might be used to help people learn about using culture for better relationships. But the question before that is, I think um, it was noted that trauma of the horses was mentioned. Can you give us any background of the horses that are in your program? I know you said they were from Sinta Gleska. Um, is there anything else that we should know about the horses? Well, horses within themselves, um, just people are aggressive when they're teaching them, you know, how to have a relationship, right? Um, one of the, the interesting things in the video that's not very clearly defined is we were haltering a young colt, a very young um, horse there. And this little horse, this little boy horse was, uh, was getting a halter put on him. And he wasn't halter broken yet. He, which he just didn't have a relationship with having a halter on. So it's, it's, it's a pretty traumatic experience. You know, suddenly you have this bridle on, you have this halter put over your head, and now you, it restricts movement. And then you compound that by having 10 guys lined up and they're all trying to put this halter on you. So just the simple act of doing that and how each individual person shows that horse that they're not there to cause them harm can either be a learning experience or a traumatic one. So even that act, so a lot of the horses that we have in our program, some of them have been neglected, some of them were, were trained improperly, some of them just through their use of uh, uh, you know, they're around the farm and what have you, um, have experienced a lot of hurt. And what we found is that when we do what, what we call the spirit connection, which is where we place a participant in the center of the room and we lunge these horses um, clockwise and counterclockwise, and then we let them kind of find the person, we actually find that the horses are, are diagnosing the participant. And we get to the point where we can say, well, these five horses typically lend to, lean themselves towards sexual trauma. And uh, I don't know if sexual trauma was part, you know, was inflicted upon the horse, but for some reason, the energy in those horses gravitate to those people. They smell that on them. And uh, so when we see that, we already have a understanding that that energy may be present. So then we start our dialoguing around that horse um, to kind of give someone a, a feeling of comfort so that they can open up and share. But like the haltering is, is really interesting to watch the guys because they're all trying to put this halter on this horse and this horse is running around the, the pin, the corral. And they're like, they're getting frustrated and they're getting angry. And it's like, well, are you being a relative or are you forcing it to do something? Or are you showing it safety first? And then they go, oh, well, no, I was just getting mad. So what, you're trying to scare something that's bigger than you? And that was a humbling experience. And I don't know, one thing that you kind of saw there too was um, when uh, Mr. Neck was on the horse and he was blindfolded. The way that exercise is, it's not really clarified in the video, but we actually have one of the other men has to guide them through the obstacle course while they're blindfolded. And you watch these great big men just suddenly become super scared because they're, they're, they're listening for outside commands. And it's a way that we, we utilize um, 
the environment to have them self-reflect on what is that like walking blindly and, and counting on your partner to lead you when you're just filled with fear. So those hosts are, are the biggest doctors we have there. And they're the most skilled doctors that we have. Um, and without those horses, a lot of those men wouldn't be able to find a connection to that child that they have within themselves because that's some of the best memories that they have is riding horses as little kids. And it's how we bring healing. So yeah, those horses are pretty amazing. Yeah, we, we appreciate that. And uh, I think the documentary really demonstrates that. I thank you very much for letting us um, share that with the audience. So do you have See, a story that you'd like to share as a final? I, I will. I, I'm going to share a story. Uh, my Aunt Karen told me that she had heard this from Vine Deloria, I think. My Aunt Karen Artichoker. And it's a pretty short story. Um, but it creates a context for how we saw violence in our communities, and I want to share it. They said uh, a long time ago, there was a, a young woman, and uh, there was a young man who was a brave young warrior. He was a skilled hunter and a good provider, and that uh, he had came and he had asked for this young woman's hand in marriage. And the family spoke to one another and they agreed. And it, as it was customary in that time, there would be a, a bride price paid. Sometimes people misunderstand that as buying, buying someone, but it was really um, an expectation that was um, set by the family to make sure that her life would be easy. And it, because men couldn't own property in our traditional ways, women owned properties. So there was actually her horses that she was receiving. It was her wealth um, because men were typically gonna die either hunting or going to war. So uh, all the property reverted to women. Um, but they, he, he brought the price, the horses and he brought the family gifts and he asked for her hand. And as it was customary then, he came to live with her family. She didn't leave her community of safety. He came and joined theirs. And when this happened, they lived together for quite a time in a really harmonious way. And uh, everyone there was really happy to see them, even expecting children soon. Uh, one night, um, the young lady's father was out collecting wood. When he came back to their teepee and he heard crying inside and he overheard his daughter talking to his wife saying that her husband had assaulted or had beaten her or something she she felt she didn't know what she had done and she was very sad and she was very hurt and you know she didn't she, she this wasn't like him but this is what he did and without a word her father got on a horse and rode over to their teepee scratched the outside son-in-law opened the opened the door and said come in and how father-in-law how are you father-in-law sat there he said i went to my teepee and i heard my daughter crying she's telling my wife that you laid hands on her i'm here to tell you son-in-law this is not how we do things we don't hurt those that we love we don't ball our fists towards our family we always teach ourselves we treat each other with love and compassion if you do this again son-in-law i'm going to come back and i'm going to kill you he got up and he left that teepee. Time passed. Winter turned to summer, to spring, winter again. Here, father and mother were sitting in the teepee and it was raining and pretty soon at their door, there their daughter was in front of them again. She was crying. She came in the teepee and father stepped out and mother and daughter began to talk about what was going on. And uh, he again heard his, her daughter share what had happened in their teepee. And just like that, father got on his horse and went over to her teepee and scratched on the door. And son-in-law said, father, why are you here? Father-in-law, why have you come? He said, to fulfill my promise to you, son-in-law. I told you not to hurt my daughter again.
in those days, the expectation of behavior was paramount because without a solid community, our community members would die. Without self-control, we would have warring families and we wouldn't have the support structures that we needed in order to thrive. In those days, communities consisted of maybe 10, 15, 20 families moving together in the, in the good weather months and everyone coming together in the winter months. So if we couldn't maintain ourselves and our behavior, it put everyone's life in jeopardy. So that was a, that was a clear message of what the expectation was. And it's a reminder of how we should be, that it shouldn't be something that's talked about, but something that's acted upon. And as good relatives in the community, we should always act when we hear someone hurt. We should always remind each other of how to be good relatives. It's not necessarily a reminder to go out and take vigilante justice, but more so that there's an expectation of how we treat each other and that that expectation should be paramount to anything else. And that it's everyone's responsibility in the community to maintain harmony. You know, we kind of got into this weird world where we don't talk to each other about things anymore. We don't have casual conversations of what it is to live. People talk to, tell you not to talk about money or politics or religion. But the reality is that those are the tools of oppression. And the reason people don't tell you to talk about them is they don't want people to riot. So we have to constantly remind each other of how to be good relatives. And we have to set the bar constantly so that we can continue to have a, a life in a community that's free of violence and one that supports healthy life ways, but it's rooted in accountability and justice for everyone, especially those survivors of violence. So that's a, that's a story that always touched me and is one that it speaks closely because I'm a survivor of domestic and sexual violence in my life. I was assaulted as a child by relatives, strangers. And I really wish that someone could have been there at that time to help me. And that's why we do the work that we do in our communities. So I really appreciate each and every one of you for taking the time today to be a part of this little visit that we had and watching this video. And for all of you that are doing the work to creating safe spaces or safer spaces within not only your working communities, but within your homes. Um, I really appreciate you sharing that about being a grandmother, because I think that that's probably the one of the most profound places anyone can learn love is from a grandparent. And uh, I'm, I look forward to hearing more wonderful things that you guys are doing down in Omaha and all the things that Metro's doing, because I re I'm always surprised every time I see what you guys are doing down there when I go visit Brother Steve. So I hope that uh, you guys all enjoyed uh, today's talk. And of course, if you guys have any questions, feel free to contact me through Barbara. I'll be happy to visit with you all. Thank you so, so, so very much. Um, really, really appreciate your being with us. And you can't tell this, Aldo, but as you've spoken, the sun has been rising. <laughs> <laughs> and we see sometimes we can see your face and sometimes the sun oh, is sorry about that <laughs> but um it's like i think it's another message it's a message from nature about the the wisdom that's coming through so really really thank you very much it's been a beautiful morning early start for you um and we we do appreciate your being with us audience members um there's so much here to learn from, and we will have a recording thanks to the generosity of Aldo. So if you wanna see this again, uh, you'll sure be able to do that. So technicians, could you please put up our online um, evaluation? That link is also in the chat. I think several of you know that we show over 50 programs annually. If you complete evaluations and include your contact information, at least 20, you will be recognized. And then finally, uh, we have a couple of different programs coming up in December. I did say that we're done with November. Um, wishing everybody a little break in time here to get yourselves together uh, with the fall quarter ending. Our next program will be from the Diversity Matters Film and Lecture Series. The title of the documentary is Farmsteaders. And some of you may know Mr. Art Tandrup. 
or Helen, who previously worked at Metropolitan Community College, his wife, um, on the December 13th, which is a Tuesday at 1230 Central Time. We will have the pleasure of watching that documentary and have Mr. Tandrup speak to um, the situation of farmers trying to you know, survive, family farmers trying to survive. Um, and Mr. Tandrup also has uh, Ponca sacred corn um, growing on his land. So he's, he's known to many um, in our communities as someone who really supports Native peoples and uh, some of the fights that we have against big business and corporations that harm Native that way. And then um, I don't know if our texts have the second slide, but I did, there we go, thank you, did want to point out that um, also during that week, it will be on the 14th of December at 1230, Mr. Vernon Miller, who's the former chair of the Omaha tribe and now working at Tufts University, is going to be our discussion leader of a book called Native Presence and Sovereignty in College, Sustaining Indigenous Weapons to Defeat Systemic Monsters. And Amanda Ticini is uh, the author. She actually was a presenter at Metro a few years back. So um, we're really excited that Mr. Miller will be with us. That will be also a virtual, both of these will be virtual activities and the registration links are in the chat. So thank you, everybody. Have a great afternoon. We really appreciate your being with us. Take care. And thank you again, although it's been just a pleasure to have you here with us.